Actually, I don't have the chat screen now that I've gone, now that I'm sharing my screen, I don't have to see chat. I'll, uh, I'll but, keep an uh, eye on it and I can call them out when uh, cool. I go on. Cool, cool, cool. Um, all right, welcome everyone. Um, so I'm going to try and keep this pretty quick, although I've got a whole bunch of different tabs, as you can <laughs> see. Um, there's a, it turns out there's a lot of different functions and features on my site, which I wasn't even aware of. Um, uh, so I'm going to try and run that through that pretty quick, and then we'll leave some time for some, some Q&A. Um, the TLDR of who I am, in case you're not familiar, um, I am a digital strategy consultant. I work for myself. Um, I've been doing that for about five years, as of last Thursday. Um, I love blogging. Uh, I run an art business with, uh, with my wife um, called Fiercely Curious. That's this that I'm not really going to talk about today, but there's that. Um, I know a little bit of Kung Fu. Uh, I'm not as rusty as I used to be. Um, I've been going pretty regularly to a, a Kung Fu spot in Brooklyn uh, for the last year. Um, I have a background in SEO. Um, I've done all of these things. I have some clients that I've worked with, but I'm not going to talk about that. Um, and I think really what, um, like Brian said, the best place to start is uh, kind of my blogging philosophy, uh, my, my philosophy for being kind of, uh, quote unquote, very online. Um, so Small View Blogging is a post that I wrote um, uh, beginning of 2018. Um, and, you know, really it kind of posits that, uh, you know, you can kind of see this stuff here. It's like, I wrote this, this blog post, Fuck Yes, Side Projects. And at the time I wrote it, it had 1600 page views, which is like, you know, when we talk about blogs and the internet and scale and social media, it's tiny. Like no one's, that's, that's almost no one read that post. Um, but I got at least one coffee meeting out of it. Um, it's a story and, and a thing that I point to regularly. It got featured in a couple of email newsletters, um, led to some really fun conversations. Um, the Consultant Grain was a blog post that I wrote that at the time of writing had 2,500 lifetime page views, um, but uh, has influenced a kind of whole genre of consulting writing that I've done. Um, there is, uh, you know, this idea that, um, you know, uh, the thesis of the post is basically that, um, you used to be able to get the homepage of like Gig, Reddit, Hacker News, these places. And that was kind of like how things got shared online. That was kind of the big wins, the, the, the home runs. Um, but those homepage wins have become much harder to get. Um, they're much bigger now, right? Like a homepage Hacker News is like 90,000 visits. Um, so they're kind of less accessible to your average user. You're kind of beginner blogger. Um, and the, it's less obvious now how things spread. It's less obvious who's reading what um but th that doesn't matter um and i kind of encourage everyone to say uh you know big b blogging is this kind of promise of audience um which is why people flock to places like medium and forbes and fast company and all of these like crappy media homes where everything looks the same and some there's some kind of like smooth frictionless sharing possible um and i really hate that i think it's um I think you're going to have a hard time if you want to try and do something that looks like everyone else's and lives in these kind of like, uh, uh, you know, big media, uh, kind of big B blogging promise things. Um, and so instead, uh, I think um, there's this kind of idea of like digital homesteading, um, so you're like building your own little home on the web. Um, and I argue that you'll reach a tiny audience, a much smaller audience than you would otherwise, but that that audience is much more engaged and much more interested uh, in what you're doing. Um, and to that end, this is, uh, this is the lifetime, oh, sorry, not lifetime. This is a 2019 uh, uh, GA for, for my site, um, 20,000 users, um, which is uh, pitifully small. Um, I think you could, um, you could probably sneeze and get more traffic than that uh, um, uh, on the web. Um, uh, uh, but th that doesn't matter. Um, that's not my point. That's not what I'm going for. Um, none of my posts have really been quote unquote big hits. Um, but, uh, you know, 20,000 users, I've had, what, four? I've been on four podcasts this year. Um, I've had so many coffee meetings, I can't count. Um, I'm doing a webinar like this. Um, I've had so many interesting conversations about the things that I've written, sparked so many connections. Um, and that's the point for me, right, is um, I kind of want to show that a small audience can be really powerful. Um, that's kind of the thesis of small blogging. So that's kind of my, my philosophy. Um, uh, it all runs through tomcritchlow.com for the most part. Um, the website is hosted on GitHub pages. Um, so I'll just kind of peek under the hood uh, real quick. So this is my, this is my, um, this is my site. Um, it's a collection of HTML files, markdown files, um, and kind of layouts. Um, uh, anyone familiar with Jekyll um, and, and uh, GitHub pages um, will recognize this. Um, I'm pretty agnostic to the kind of underlying quote unquote technology of it. Um, but one thing that I really like about this is that pretty much everything is just a text file, right? It's a markdown file, but markdown is just text really, right? So um, I have a kind of a copy of my entire site on my computer as text, 
for the most part. And then there's a little bit of like, you know, technology magic that strings it all together and does some of the things like RSS feed and, um, you know, lists of posts, blog chains that we'll get to later and so on. Um, but for the most part, I like that this is all just text. Um, I write it in here. Um, I push it live uh, through the GitHub um, GUI, um, which uh, uh, might horrify some developers in the audience. But um, I, I really try and avoid anything that looks like a server, anything that looks like a command line, uh, I kind of run away from. Um, so um, that's uh, kind of, that's what this whole thing is powered through. Um, much like Brendan, if anyone saw Brendan's thing, I've got a, a now page, um, which is where I kind of post what I'm up to right now. This is powered by Derek Sievers. Um, I just updated this uh, this month. Um, so this is kind of a big, you know, kind of a, a snapshot of what I'm doing right now. Um, shout out to Brian, who's, uh, who's on the call. I'm writing little features um, with Brian right now. Um, I'm writing a book about independent consulting uh, for anyone that might be interested in that. Um, and yeah, I've done some fun experiments. One of the nice things about running on Jekyll and GitHub pages is that it's very easy to get to kind of raw HTML output. So I can, I can kind of fiddle and play um, with stuff pretty easily. Um, this is a post that I wrote last year about um, how to make AMP stories um, using Jekyll and GitHub pages, um, which produces a kind of output like uh, this kind of thing. Um, and this kind of obviously works best on, on the phone where it's like a tappable story, a little bit like Instagram stories. Um, this is an AMP story um, that, that I run. Um, and this is powered off, if I can go and find the page. Uh, what's that going to be? That's going to be in uh, stories, MBA. So this is the, the complete code to generate that um, on the back end, having written a, a custom template. Um, but this is kind of a, a front mapper um, is what it's called in, uh, in Jekyll. Um, so I really enjoy this kind of like interplay of, um, oh, I want to write a new page template that can be anything. It could be a JavaScript thing, it could be a HTML thing. Um, and I want to have it powered from my site somehow. Um, Jekyll uh, and, and GitHub pages makes that pretty easy. So what's the like back end of that Jekyll thing? Is there like a plugin or a bit of code that takes that and then puts it? Okay. Yeah, this is, a, this is a, the AMP play out here, which actually, so this is basically, this looks like a lot of code, but almost all of this is just the kind of HTML wrapper of an AMP story. Okay. And, uh, and then the bits that get generated go in like, um, where is it? Where's the for loop? Uh, where's the for loop? It's like, yeah. So then you go four page in pages. It puts these grids in here. Um, so it's like basically, uh, so four page in pages there. These are the pages that I've defined here, and like some of them have a single variable, which is just mm -hmm. a GIF. So then, then if you flip back to, to here, um, you know, it's like that kind of like. So this page is is uh, two variables. It's huh. a text in the middle and an image background, um, and then and then the kind of code spits it out. And then everything else that's happening here with the like little uh, timeline at the bottom arrows, that's all like AMP. That's stuff. all AMP story okay. uh, standard out of the box. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, but the, you know things like this. Um, are not necessarily, I think it's easier to do something like this with Jekyll than it is with WordPress. Um, that's a slightly opinionated statement, but, but this idea that, um, you know, getting to raw HTML output and, and, and fiddling with that is much easier. I don't have to go into a server anywhere. I just define a new layout, a new page, uh, and kind of write straight to HTML, which is kind of fun. Um, and so the workflow for like a new feature on your blog starts with like a Jekyll template and then defining kind of like the data that goes into that template? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Most of the time, actually, it starts with raw HTML. So, okay. um, if you if you start a, a file with these uh, three dashes followed by two dashes, I just write HTML. So then I, I I prototype it as a static HTML page, oh. and then kind of it's very easy to turn this then into a template and kind of add a for loop and say, okay, I want these things to be, I want six of these driven by, you know, a, a model. yeah. That's a really cool workflow. Yeah. So it's it's, it's pretty easy. Um, which which is nice. Um, so. AMP stories is one of the kind of things that I've been fiddling with. Um, uh, this is all on the front end, but this is another thing that I've been fiddling with. Um, so everywhere on my site, I have uh, annotations set up. So um, this is an annotation somebody's left here, um, which works very much like a kind of Google Docs um, inline comments uh, type thing. You can see, whoops, sorry. You can see all the annotations on the page here. Somebody left an annotation on this bit here. Somebody left an annotation on this bit. Um, and this is all powered by uh, a tool, a JavaScript uh, library called Hypothesis, um, which I've installed on my site. 
Um, I have it hidden by default because um, otherwise I find it kind of gets in the way a little bit too much. It's quite heavy handed. Um, but I really like having this. Um, not too many people use it, but I, I like when people do use it, I think they write, they get really, really engaged. Um, so this was, so I, I, I'm writing a book and I basically put an explicit call to action on this page. I say, hey, um, here's the outline for the book. Um, please sign up for this tool hypothesis and then add some, add some annotations. Uh, and I currently have 75 annotations on this page, um, which is really cool. There's some really cool like threaded discussion around different points um, and you can kind of dive into it and, and see what people are talking about, see which people resonate. Um, it's kind of kind of fun. So, uh, but that's all on the front end. There's nothing, nothing server side that I do uh, to enable that. Um, and no one needs to have like an, an uh, the hype. I th feel like I remember there being a hypothesis plugin or extension or something. So uh, yeah, so this is, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a Chrome extension um, uh -huh. that you can use. So you can use this, this functionality on any web page, gotcha. but I have it embedded in JavaScript on the page. So you don't yes. need this plugin to, to use this, but you gotcha. do need a hypothesis account to, to comment, not to view them, but to add a comment or add, a, add, a, add an annotation. Cool. Um, uh, and so, uh, so this is a great example of small B blogging. I wrote, uh, where is it? Hang on, let me find it in my blockchains. Um, I have a blockchains about annotations. And I wrote this post in February, exploring the UX of web annotations, um, where I talked about basically like comparing a hypothesis with a Genius, which is another annotation layer with the Google Docs mobile format. Um, and kind of basically the TLDR is that hypothesis kind of still sucks on mobile today. Um, and this post got, I don't know, a few hundred page views, like not very much. Um, but I got invited to go speak at the I Annotate conference in DC, um, kind of off the back of this. Um, they, they, it's mostly a kind of academic uh, tool, um, and they wanted a kind of blogger to come in with that perspective. So um, that's kind of another example of small B blogging in action of, of writing something, getting it to the right, you know, hundred people that see it, and then uh, you know, sparking some super interesting kind of conversations and, and ideas off the back of it. Um, so that's that. Um, these are my blog chains, um, which we, we kind of talked about. So um, blog chains, how do blog chains work? Blog chain is basically a, a, the right way to think about it is a, a threaded series of blog posts or a tag page, which has a linear order to it. So this is my annotations blockchain where it starts with this one, number one, number two, number three, number four. Um, and if you go to a, a post in the blockchain, I add this kind of little, um, you know, kind of navigation between the, between the posts on here. Um, so you can go to those. Um, this is kind of a list of all the blockchains that I have on at the moment. Um, I just wrote one this morning, um, new blogging uh, number two, um, featuring CJ, who's, uh, who's somewhere on the call. Um, so this is kind of all about uh, this kind of new blogging idea. Um, and CJ, I'm just gonna give a quick call out. Uh, where are we? Um, he just wrote this post uh, on blogging futures. Um, and he has this um, glitch app embedded on his site that basically lets anyone um, uh, uh, um, the other way. um, anyone add in their own post into his kind of blockchain. So this is what I think of as like, if you think about, uh, the blockchain that I have today being very linear. So series of posts in order, this is like a, a, a branching threading, like you might get on Twitter or somewhere um, that lets anyone kind of throw in their own post into this, into this blockchain, which is kind of fun. So, so props to CJ for that. I'm really excited about what that might do. And also just like, I love this idea of having a little glitch app embedded in, in line is, is really fun. Um, then we get to the wiki. So, so before I get to the wiki proper, um, yeah, was there a question? Uh, some people were curious about AMP stuff, but oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I think it's more just like how useful do you find AMP, uh, or what was the outcome of that whole thing? Um, what was the outcome of the whole thing? Mm. I think the long and the short of it is that Google AMP stories in particular, which is what I was playing around with, um, are not yet ready for prime time. The interactions mm -hmm. and fluidity of it are not as good as Instagram stories. Mm -hmm. And because we're so used to Instagram stories, you, you notice very quickly, they're like in the uncanny valley right now of like, oh, this is like almost as good as Instagram stories, but just sucks. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that they are the future. I think some, something like something on the web, something web native that's gonna be tappable is going to be the future. Um, I don't know if it's going to be AMP stories, and I don't know if their current format is going to make it, quote unquote. Um, cool. So, but I really enjoyed playing with it. Um, the format just feels very interesting and different. So, so I really enjoyed that kind of like um, that tap to reveal mechanic. Um, is really fun. Anyone familiar with Robin Sloan's fish 
tap essay from a long time ago. Um, if you're not, um, you should look it up. Um, it's very, very cool. Um, and just demonstrates the idea of like click to reveal, right? Like text is very linear. You can scan, you can look ahead. With a click to reveal, uh, there's more surprise, there's more delight. You can do this more guided form of storytelling um, for better or for worse. So um, here, I'll just, uh, uh, I'll bring it up. Um, I got the link, drop it in there. Um, uh, uh, it's this, um, which is probably, I don't think it works on the, maybe, maybe it works on the web. I'm not sure. It seems like um, it's on itch. Yeah, it's on itch. Anyway, this is the thing. You should look it up. It's very cool. Um, and, and really like highlights the power of, of tap based stories, um, which I think is, it's going to be the future. Um, so I really, it was fun to play with AMP stories just to kind of get a feel for it. It was very, it was, you know, stealing the AMP stories like skeleton lets you like uh, experiment very quickly. So, so that's kind of the, the biggest takeaway I had from it. How, and also, uh, by the way, it's also like my day job is working with media companies. So uh, it was really useful for me to be able to talk knowledgeably about what you can and can't do with AMP stories. Um, I had a couple of clients who were like, hey, we should do these AMP story things. And I was like, eh, I mean, maybe, <laughs> um, uh, but maybe not. Um, and if you are going to do them, here are some gotchas and here are some things that I've, that I've learned. So. How uh, well adopted is the AMP stories thing? Like if I open that thing up in Firefox, is it going to make any sense or? Uh, I, it'll make sense in Firefox, I think. Um, uh, I think they're like, I mean, G Google made them originally, yeah. so they're relatively robust, uh, but uh, I don't think they're very well adopted in terms of like most publishers and media sites. Are not okay. using them. Um, uh, this is actually uh, uh, an old client of mine uh, that I worked with at the beginning of the year, and they've been using AMP Stories um, uh, in kind of interesting ways. And they have these AMP Stories at the bottom of their pages. Um, so they've been kind of like actually making them, which is kind of cool and actually putting yeah. effort into make them. Every other publisher I know is basically just like regurgitating content huh. through that they already have into an AMP story. Uh, but this is like kind of AMP native, AMP story native stuff, which is kind of interesting. The trajectory of the like stories feature is fascinating where it just like got adopted everywhere and now it's coming somewhat standardized. Oh yeah, totally. I mean, it's, yeah, it's clearly gonna be the future. I also, uh, 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 where's that link? Um, this is a really interesting thing that um, it's just very slick. So this is a, a web design agency that I worked with. I collaborated, I worked on this project uh, very briefly. Um, and I'll check, I'll look at it in mobile. Here. So they have this, like, they kind of have their own, uh, see if this works on a, they've kind of built their own swipe wall. Huh story format to put their case studies in, which I think is pretty, pretty neat. Yeah. Uh, um, it kind of works really well. Um, so uh, that's something that I'm thinking of. Uh, I'm actually kind of rebuilding something similar for, for a project that I'm working on right now, um, copying this kind of style more than the AMP story style. Um, so. Cool. Uh, yeah. Wiki. Um, the wiki. So Brendan was on, he did one of these last week or, or two weeks ago. Um, Brendan's Canon page, which if you haven't seen it, looks like this. Um, it's like a, basically a list of all of his kind of personal favorite, like evergreen things cut up by category. Uh, very cool. Um, where Brendan did it, I was a huge fan. And I was like, oh, I want to do one of those. And Brendan even made it easy for other people to make them. Um, he had a kind of whole template. Um, I, try, I wrestled for, for years, um, like literally about a year, like making my own Canon page. And I was like, oh, I've got all these things and I want to put all these links in it. But as I made it and as I kept tinkering with it, it was increasingly obvious that um, this was an evolving and, uh, and kind of like constantly moving target. And that what I needed was not a Canon page, but rather a place to kind of keep evergreen things, but in a way that could evolve. Um, so I made this, which is my wiki. Um, and there was kind of a couple things that happened all at once to kind of pull this together. Um, one was this like, you know, the Canon idea that I wanted to like uh, do something with. Um, and this just hosts like, you know, kind of um, text and links and, and stuff in here. Um, but the big breakthrough was realizing that on the back end, uh, using Jekyll, um, the back end of this is, is, just, is just text files and, and like images, uh, PDFs and stuff. And I just dropped them into these folders. So there's this idea that um, I want to build this to, to, to last for like 10, 20 years. And I want to be kind of relatively agnostic to the technology. So all of the kind of the front end stuff that does this layout and does this design and does the, like the, the kind of logic of it is all abstracted away from what the raw like folders of stuff. So I have a folder of stuff that I just want to put here. And it's like, that's an image that I put in. That's the, HT, the, that's the, the index. 
another image. This is just some links and notes that I have. And these are just text files and images. So I feel like I can just download these uh, or they're already on my, on my computer and do whatever I want with them uh, in the future. So that was kind of a big breakthrough for me. Um, and then uh, also, um, you know, uh, uh, reading this, um, uh, building a digital garden. This is the piece that, that I wrote where I kind of launched it. Um, and there's this concept of like, you know, streams, which is Twitter, campfires, like small groups and gatherings that I think I was kind of blogging. And then gardens, which is like, you know, what are these knowledge gardens that kind of exist for much longer time and kind of evolve, you know, deeper form thinking. Um, and that's what the wiki is, is for me. Um, and that's kind of been this, I'd say it's very much a kind of wild garden right now. It's not very well uh, maintained or tended. Um, uh, like what's a good example of that? If I go to, uh, uh, I go to like my architecture one, it's like, it's kind of a mess. Like it doesn't really make sense. Like this, like multiple links, to the same things. So, um, it's not very well maintained. It's kind of a wild garden. Um, but I, but I really like it. Um, and one of the things that I did most recently that, that has really helped me, uh, help improve this whole thing, um, has been, um, this post that I wrote about using screener tape. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with screener tape, but it's basically a, a Mac app um, or a Windows app as well. But um, every time I take a screenshot, it saves that screenshot, it OCRs it and saves it into a, into a folder. So, um, so if we go back to my wiki for a second, so let's say um, I have this architecture wiki where I pull architecture stuff. Um, and let's say I want, um, I find a cool image or a cool web page. Um, Actually, a web page is a better example. Let's see, like uh, the Instagram Wikipedia page for sale. I'm like, oh, this is really cool. Um, uh, yeah, so let's say I want to say, all right, I'm going to take a screenshot of this area of the page, something about this is really interesting. I just grab that screenshot and then uh, basically move that out of the way. In uh, screen rotate, this one, I just drag it. Uh, into my architecture folder and this HTML file gets saved to my architecture folder. Um, and what's nice about that is if I show you the output we're over here. So this is, so this is an example output from screener tape, which is, it saves the image, which is a screenshot that I captured, but it also saves the URL of where I found it, the title of the page where I found it. And it also OCRs the text in it. Um, so if I go to something like here, this is a screenshot and it, it, see this, this is just an image, this whole thing's an image, but it, it's pulled out that text. It's just OCR that text. So it's copy and pasteable, um, and searchable and findable. Um, so this for me is like the, the title of the blog post was, uh, planting new varietals in my digital garden, um, which is basically like a, a, it's a new file type or a new way of putting file types into my digit, into my wiki. Um, that has really improved my, uh, just my workflow, um, generally, which is kind of cool. That is so cool. Um, the other thing that I've done to help. So originally when I started putting things in my wiki, I would do a lot of this, right? I just put URLs in and that's cool. Cause you think you're going to remember what that URL is in six months, but actually you don't. Um, and so increasingly what I've started doing, um, is I wrote a, so let's say I want to grab a quote from this page. So I select the text. And then I wrote a little JavaScript bookmarklet that just grabs that quote um, and puts it into markdown format so that I can go back into my architecture wiki, wiki architecture uh, links. And then I just paste and it pastes the quote um, kind of all in there with the source and the quote. Um, so that I, so it's much easier for me to now, um, I'll delete that for you. Uh, so it's much easier for me to do things like this, where it's like, it's much easier to kind of come back to something later uh, and, and kind of kind of remember uh, what it was that I was looking at or what I was, I was, uh, I was interested in. A um, couple more things. Um, so I'm almost, I'm going to wrap up soon and then we'll just do Q&A. Um, so a couple more things on my site. Um, one is I built a, this is my RSS reader that is hosted on my site that anyone can look at um, and is, is uh, run off a of Google Doc that, that um, fetches all these RSS feeds and publishes all the links it finds. Um, and then there's like a, a tool called tabletop JS, which then just publishes it onto this web page. Um, I don't recommend anyone build their own RSS reader. It's a pain in the fucking ass and there are plenty of tools to do that for you, for you but, but it was a thing that it, I'm a nerd and I wanted to do that myself. Um, 
it, it breaks all the time. So it's not that great. Um, but uh, everyone should have an RSS reader. So I read my, read my feeds. Um, and then I've got what, the last thing that I'm going to talk about um, before I hand over is, um, you know, I want my blog to lo live for a long time. Um, I, want, uh, I, want, I want my posts to be uh, archivable. Um, and I think archiving is, is increasingly a kind of a, a radical or kind of um, interesting act. Um, and so what I really love about, uh, about Jekyll and uh, Markdown pages and GitHub pages is that my blog lives, this is a, a folder on my website. So, these, so if, if, if GitHub disappeared tomorrow, I would have a copy of my blog already on my site, like kind of like pre-archived, if you like. Um, if I lose my computer, I've got a copy of my blog on GitHub. Um, if I lose both my computer and GitHub, then a lot of this stuff will still live on, uh, on Google, right, um, in, in the index. Um, but increasingly, I thought that might not be quite enough, and especially for like super long-term stuff. So I built um, this which just takes the RSS feed from my website and then uh, runs every URL through the archive.org um, so that uh, basically as soon as a blog post get live, goes live, it gets archived in archive.org um, so that I can go, uh, if, you know, 20 years, um, hopefully, um, I can go back and find every single post um, that I've written, um, post on there. Um, I'm not necessarily sure how kosher this is from the archive.org's perspective. Um, you know, I don't blog that much, so I'm not posting very many URLs there. Um, I did set up a five bucks a month donation to them. I suspect, I, I recommend you all do the same because <laughs> uh, I think uh, they're very cool. Um, Was that a Google script? Yeah, that's a Google script in a spreadsheet. Do you find those handy? Uh, I've like I've, seen the editor and never gotten into it. But I've been writing these for about 10 years. Um, okay. Um, yeah, um, they're, they're very cool and super, I mean, it's like, it's like duct tape coding. Like these things are not like a real developer would look at this and like vomit <laughs> um, in their mouth. Um, but I just, I, I love it uh, for like getting up and running um, like straight away. Um, there's almost no better tool that, that I know of. So cool. Um, yeah. So that's kind of my blog. That's me. But I, I want to talk about what you guys want to talk about. So um, maybe we should open the floor up. Yeah. Does anyone have any kind of burning questions? I have a couple of things I can get into if uh, no one else is going for it. Uh, Rolf is asking about Jekyll for someone coming from WordPress, like uh, um, learning it and getting used to it. Yeah, uh, I think I think the like z starting from scratch learning Jekyll is super easy. Um, if you've ever used Shopify's language, uh, Liquid Markup, it's the same thing. Um, it's very very so a layout like my blog layout looks like this. It's like just like you can include other snippets. So he's just saying like, include this other snippet, include this other snippet. Um, you write HTML and then you just say something like this, like if page dot subtitle, then you put that in there and then end if. Um, it's very straightforward. Um, it's very, like you can see the indentation here and so on. It's kind of wild. Um, it, it, it's very uh, robust. Uh, you don't have to worry about spacing, tabs, uh, fancy characters even really. It's all just like if page dot subtitle, if page dot blockchain. Um, it's all pretty easy, um, so I think the I think it's pretty easy to get set up and running with it. Um, now, I don't actually run Jekyll even on my own computer. Um, I just let GitHub hmm. Pages kind of compile it on their end. Um, so there is, you know, you can write your own plugins. You can have, there's a whole there is a lot more to learn if you really want to go down that path. But um, to get up and running, and certainly if you want to host on GitHub Pages, it's 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 dead simple. What's the like a uh, loop if you're building a new page? Is it like do you run a local server to like view changes in your browser or like if you modify a template, how do you? View, uh, 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 viewing changes in your browser is on your local computer is for suckers. Um, I should do it live. <laughs> <Cool. laughs> That's not a very satisfying answer. Yes, you can run Jekyll on your local machine and you can just preview it that way. Um, I choose not to, um, okay. but you certainly can. Uh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, look at the comments now as well. Uh, where else are we? Uh, oh yeah, we're going to talk about consulting a little bit. Um, let me, uh, so on my site, I wrote, um, uh, so this is probably the, the best reference, I think, for like how my personal site interplay, into, into, uh, interconnects with my consulting work, which is I was going to launch a new brand. I was going to launch this website, Yes And, um, just a couple of years ago now. Um, 
to kind of help you know, be a brand and showcase my consulting work. And I realized through a process of introspection that for me personally, everyone's different. Uh, for me personally, um, uh, the brand was just getting in the way of selling myself. What people want to buy as a consultant is Tom Critchlow. Um, that is the, that is the, the thing, excuse me. Um, that is the thing that I'm offering. Um, and so I just thought, uh, putting a brand in the way just kind of like adds friction and adds complexity and confusion to a thing, which is really just, you are buying my time. I am a consultant. Um, here I am. Um, so I decided to just put it on tomcritchlow.com, um, and get rid of the brand. Uh, people obviously have different strokes for different folks. What I will say is, uh, just because I write about all kinds of weird stuff, um, like, uh, you know, like what's the weirdest thing that I wrote recently? Like, uh, Occult ads. Yeah, like occult ads or something. I mean, even that's talking about media, I guess, uh-huh. but like um, blood in the feed, um, which is like nothing about, it's all about like this like weird Instagram experience that I have and how like re- retargeting ads are kind of predatory. Um, just because somebody sees that and they see it in one context doesn't mean that they might not also uh, hire you to, to do consulting work. Not necessarily because of the post, but because they saw the post and they see you, like being visible in people's feeds is a kind of precursor to people hiring you. Um, and I think that... Uh, I really think of everything that I put on my site as somehow being connected to my consulting work. Um, you know, it's not, I don't have like a big divide. Um, and I think that I'd really encourage you to just be visible, um, show your thinking, even if it's not directly about consulting um, or about the industry they're in, but just showing your thinking, being visible, being present, saying interesting things um, is going to help you get clients. Um, and uh, I think, um, I just had my five year like freelance anniversary um, last week. Um, so I posted this like five years on the road um, and I've done this for the last four years now. Um, and in this post, I talk about how um, a client of mine that I worked with for a year, um, this is that email to me after reading my two years on the road piece in 2016, they sent me an email and was like, Hey, I didn't realize you were focusing specifically on content or publishing. That's interesting. We might work together in the future. That was in 2016. And then in 2018, they finally closed, we finally closed the deal and, and, and they became a consulting client. Um, so it kind of shows this like long term meandering, like you have to have multiple touch points and people will enter in through all kinds of weird side doors. They're not, you know, they're not going to come in just through my like hire me page, right? That isn't necessarily the place people enter. Um, but uh, it's worth doing this publishing. It's worth like writing about what you do, um, writing about the kind of work that you do, um, I think is really important. I wrote about that in, uh, uh, so I have, um, I do, this is another page template that I have, but it's all lives on my own site. This is, this is like a book chapter, um, what that I'm writing. Um, and I wait, that's not the one I want, uh, which is the one I want. Um, uh, this is the one I want strange attraction. Um, I wrote about this idea that, um, how do you generate leads for an independent consulting practice? And it really comes down to the same philosophy, which is small D blogging, which is like being public on the web writing stuff on the web, letting people know what you're doing and why you're doing it um, is the thing that attracts really good leads um, to you, right? Um, So it's like, you know, as a consultant, my best leads are going to come through my personal network. They're not going to come from somebody coming from Google or somebody coming from some random connection, um, at least not initially. Um, And so I write primarily for my friends. I write primarily for the people I know. I write primarily for those like 100 or 200 or 300 people that are going to read that post. And if I can help them understand what I do and why I do it and how I do it, then they're going to send work my way. Um, and that's kind of this like core philosophy around, um, you know, this is like one of, this is a friend introducing me to work. This is a friend introducing me to work. Um, this is a friend introducing me to work. Um, that's like literally, I think I have a table in here somewhere. Uh, yeah. So this is like, I've removed the names of the innocent, but these are five, uh, four friends that I have and the percentage of all-time revenue that they sent to me. Um, and cumulative, you can see that this adds up to what's that 50, like 65, uh, 60% um, of my, of my all time revenue has come from four people that I know personally, um, and that, the, and that read my blog. So, you know, that's kind of like, you go back to this number, right? It's like 20,000 people read the site, but it's like, some of these people are real people. <laughs> um, and that really, that really matters. Um, that was a lot of talking. Any more questions? One thing I'd be interested in is like this, you mentioned even here, like this kind of like long game of blogging, right? Mm -hmm. Like where you're not going to see payoff or not necessarily like explicit value, but just like things add up over time. 
are there like explicit strategies where you're thinking about like I don't know going back and like reading old posts how do you keep that long history of the blog fresh or like cached in your head in order to work with it uh, that's a good idea uh, so so um, Ben Katash um, has this really great um, great great blog post called the calculus of grit um, in which he talks about these three kind of guiding principles for for that question of like uh, are you on the right lines? Are you going in the right direction? Um, and it's the three R's. It's you should be releasing work, releasing posts. You should reference them often. So you go back and reference your old work and you should rework ideas. So release, reference and rework um, uh, as this kind of like core philosophy of if you're doing that, then everything is naturally going to compound, right? If you, if you are releasing things often, if you're referencing back to things you already wrote. And if you're reworking ideas continually, then everything is just going to grow and grow and compound and build. Um, uh, so that's kind of like a core philosophy. But I think that um, the blockchains for me have been really, really useful to start to start to do that connective tissue from, you know, like my on the road posts. It's not necessarily straightforward to go back and find this one that I wrote in 2016, which is two years on the road, three years on the road, four years on the road, five years on the road. Like uh, having these all kind of strung together with this like connective tissue. Um, is really starting to help me, and I think my readers, uh, do some of that like crate picking, like go back into the archives and understand a bit better of like what am I writing about and what's what's going on here. Uh, so. Sweet. What's the uh, infrastructure for the blockchain like? Is it just tag? Like, how do you designate that something is in a chain with something else? Yeah, uh, I'll show you the one that I wrote today. Um, uh, oh, this is another thing. Sorry, this is an aside. I forgot to mention. Um, in my wiki, by the way, um, I have a drafts folder, which is all my blog post drafts. So they're all Ooh. public. You can find them on my website if you want to poke around. Um, I don't really tell people that directly necessarily too often because I think there's some embarrassing stuff in there. But, um, <laughs> feel free to do some crate digging and some archival work. Um, so this is a blog post that I wrote this morning um, where I referenced CJ um, on this kind of new blogging infrastructure. Um, so I'll just kind of, this is the, this is what you, everything in between these dotted lines is what we call front matter in, in Jekyll. Um, and they're just variables, right? So it's like layout blog that says use the blog layout of this post. This is the title, pretty straightforward. This is the subtitle, pretty straightforward. Um, and then I, I just added my own variable, which is blog chain. Um, and then I just reference the blog chain by name, say new blogging. Cool. And then what that does in my blog chain template, uh, uh, where is that layouts blockchain? So it just says you basically say um, for all the posts on the site, if post dot blockchain, if it has a blockchain um, uh, 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 tag, um, and if that blockchain contains this this name that we're currently on of the blockchain, then display the post. Um, so it really cool. it, on the back end. Basically, what it's doing when you go to like this annotations page, it basically loops through every post on my site, checks if it has blockchain associated with it. It does have blockchain, and that blockchain says annotations, then you play them in reverse chronological order. Uh, sorry, in chronological, not reverse chronological, because um, this is the oldest one at the top. Um, so it goes one, two, three, four um, for those posts that are here. So, and so and Jekyll makes that pretty easy. Like, I like the fact that you can kind of mess around with this stuff quite easily without having to touch a database. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, and that's another thing. Um, this is like proper inside of baseball, um, but I guess this whole this whole <laughs> webinar yeah. is inside of baseball. Um, so, so the the front end of my site is uh, I use this uh, CSS framework called Tachyons, um, which I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with. Um, but one of the things, so so what this does is it gives you horrible, horrible uh, <laughs> uh, uh, HTML, and it basically allows you to write layout in the HTML without writing custom CSS, because these are basically just CSS variables. This is saying vertical padding three, uh, center of the element, uh, padding left four for large screens, font size three, um, line height copy. Um, but what that does is, because I, 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 I didn't use this for a long time, and what I found was when I wanted to make a new page like this, for example, I'd go and add like a few um, CSS classes into my CSS, right? It'd be like, here's like a, a blockchain CSS. Uh, a, a class or whatever, right? Um, but then if I got rid of blockchains later, I wouldn't go back, like no one goes back to clean up the CSS, right? Um, so there was kind of this bloat would happen over time. This way, I'm very free to make a new page and make it look whatever I want. But then if I get rid of it, I just get rid of the page. I haven't written any custom CSS for it. So there's no like bloat has accumulated. 
um, you know, um, I'm trying out a new, uh, a new homepage right now with a new design. And there's no, I haven't written a single line of CSS to kind of do this layout in here. It's all just kind of tacky on variables. So if I decide to change it or if I decide I don't care for it in the end, I can just get rid of it without having, without having kind of accumulated any CSS junk, um, which personally for my brain works really well. Um, I think pe people that are real developers have very strong opinions um, <laughs> about, uh, about tachyons and, and about that kind of approach to writing code, um, but I don't care. It works for me. So. I've, uh, like, I've tried to use tachyons before on like, fixed projects, and it never really made sense to me in that context, but it makes a lot of sense in this kind of like, experimentation, slow growing, trying things out and scrapping a context. So that, yeah. Yeah, that, that specific context just really helps me, um, as well as like, I've been a, I, throughout my career, I've always like, stolen bits of code. Like I just, I'll just <laughs> grab something and try and make it work. And tachyons just makes that really easy. Where if you see something else that the tachyon site has made, you're like, oh yeah, I'm gonna, just gonna use that. Um, so uh, that's, that's kind of nice. Like this footer, for example, is one of the default footers that tachyons has in their site. Nice. So, so I just kind of copied it, pasted it, which worked for me. So um, any other questions? Anyone still listening? <laughs> I have a question uh, regarding blockchains, Tom. Um, how did you get started with doing the shared blockchain with Brendan? Because I think seeing that just kind of opened my mind to, oh, wow, I can actually have a conversation with somebody through my blog post. Because I think sometimes we have writer's block. And we're like, what am I going to write about? But having a conversation with somebody through posts almost just kind of opens up this, all the possibilities, I suppose. So I'm curious about that. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, so blockchains, I, I first learned about blockchains from Venkatesh Rao. I think, I think he kind of coined the term. Um, and he has these blockchains going right now. Um, I think it is, which is the one that he shares with Ian Chang? There's one about, so, uh, which is the one that he has? I don't know which one it is. Maybe it isn't this list. Oh, maybe it's not active. Um, so, so basically, um, so Ribbon Farm is a single site, but uh, Venkatesh did a, did a blockchain where uh, Venkatesh and um, Ian Cheng, who's, who's a, an artist, uh, went back and forth. They just swapped, right? It was like post number one, Venkatesh. Post number two, Ian. Post number three, Venkatesh. Post number four, Ian. And it has that explicit call response, call response. Um, but Ribbon, for, Ribbon Farm, even though it's mostly Venkatesh, is a multi-author blog, right? Like they have different authors on there generally. Um, and so where Brendan and I, Brendan and I thought, hey, we should do a blockchain where we go back and forth. It didn't really make sense to host it on brendanschlegel.com. It didn't really make sense to host it on tomcristo.com because they're both single author sites. But we very quickly realized that you could just go back and forth across, across domains. Um, and so what I did was um, uh, I actually just like a total, total hack. Um, somebody let me know if there's a better way to do this. Um, I make a, so I made a post uh, uh, like um, network community random blockchain one. So um, I make a, a, a an empty post and I add this re redirect attribute into it, and then that page just does a meta meta refresh to uh, to Brandon's site, um, and then and then you know go back and forth post number two, and you can see like these are the three posts, but you click on number one, number three, and they go to Brandon. Um, and then vice versa, Brendan looked back to my posts um, in it. So that was kind of the, the thinking behind it. Um, and I actually think, you know, just like everything old is new again, this isn't like a radical idea in terms of like blogging and people have been doing web rings and all kinds of things for years, but uh, this call response mechanism, I think is really interesting. And in particular, uh, you know, when we think about quote unquote, the web we lost and what social media has done to blogging, I think the biggest thing that it's done to blogging is it's killed comments. It hasn't actually stopped the, the blogging part of it. It's actually like still kind of like vibrant and so on. But the comments and the discussion around blog posts has moved almost entirely to Twitter in my, in my network at least, right? So uh, I think we're starved for ways of responding to blog posts that isn't just a tweet. Um, and, uh, you know, Twitter still hasn't made it easy to embed at the bottom of a post all the tweets about that post um, for some unknown reason. Um, so, uh, you know, this idea of like threading conversation back and forth between blog posts, I think is actually really interesting and, and, a, and a thing that is needed. Um, so I would love to make this a little bit more seamless, a little bit easier. Um, I haven't quite figured out how to do that yet, but um, Brendan and I are kind of slowly, slowly working on it. And CJ's latest, right? CJ's latest post, I think, um, is, is, is definitely a 
know, this idea of uh, having that embedded, uh, where is it? Um, this embedded glitch app that lets you lets you write a post, submit it into the, the user's form, and then have it show up in the in the thread is like that's a that's another way to do it. Um, uh, you know, some people use web mentions, um, which is like technically a a tool and a and a kind of syntax that will support this. But web mentions is like web mentions is broken. Um, I I uh, just can't get it to work. Um, so I, I I think we deserve better than web mentions. Um, so um, I really want to try and build something that is more robust and better. Frankly, any other questions? Yeah. Anyone still listening? No. This is CJ again. Um, <laughs> I was wondering, have you ever thought of trying to do something in between a wiki and a blog and a, a blockchain? I'm imagining something where you're you almost have like a couple of blockchains related to one post, and it's just this almost referential web of sorts. But I can imagine. It getting overly complicated, but I'm I'm curious at least to where yes. it um give me a second while I think about what the post was uh that I wrote. Uh here we are. Yeah, so this is a post that I wrote about um how and why to roll, roll your own frameworks and consulting engagements, which was you know like a long form, like this is like a chapter in my book, long blog post, blah 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 blah. Nobody cares, nobody cares. Um but then as you go towards the bottom, I have this theory about one way to like uh, pretend or one way to get better at doing frameworks is like doodling and diagrams. And so I included a few different people that I like who do doodling and diagrams, including Venkatesh Rao and Mark Pollard and Ahi and Thompson. But then uh, I basically said, oh, actually, I'm going to keep collecting people who do diagramming and doodling in my wiki. So I'm going to keep this little section alive and I'm going to expand it here. So this is basically like a longer and more evergreen version of that little thing that I tease. And this has people that weren't on the, like this guy wasn't in my blog post, he didn't quite make it, Human Cloud didn't make it, Wardley Map. So like, this is like an ever growing, evergreen thing with tons of links and it's like a mess as you can see. Um, this is the kind of wiki version of this portion of the blog post. So I think that's kind of what you're getting at, I guess, which is, you know, like a blog post is a bit more dressed up, like it is designed for reading. A wiki isn't really designed for reading. It's designed for, like, I guess, exploring. Um, so uh, does that answer your question? Have you got any ideas for how to make this better? I'm, I'm curious. I, uh... There is one thing I, uh, I played around with a while ago. It's called Smallest Federated Wiki. I don't know if you've heard that before, but um, it's by the guy that, I guess, quote, unquote, invented the wiki. But it's this weird kind of applet that allows you to write on these little cards that are kind of like homes for topics and you can constantly add and you can fork you know other people's cards so yeah if you just scroll through it's almost this kind of format but um i think there's a remixable app version on glitch i'll post it in the comments but it's if you look at some demos there's a lot of cool use cases for it but it kind of fits in this weird in between a blogging and you know having a wiki i suppose yeah. That's really cool. Um, I have actually played around with this a, a bunch. Um, it's too complicated. Um, yeah. I think it's it's like there's a really hardcore community that like try that like loves this format and has like got their head around it. Um, it just doesn't buy. It just seems overly complicated to me for what I think we expect on the modern web. Um, but I also think uh, I would love a kind of a default wiki software that mm. was as good as WordPress or like as good as like Jekyll or something like something that was kind of designed for a personal wiki that wasn't like every personal wiki software is just like overly complicated and feels like a database and feels like it was in the nineties. Like it's just really bad. Um, lots of people have built their own. This is, this is my wiki page, wikis wiki, page wiki. on my wiki. Um, <laughs> this is a wiki of wikis. Um, and there's some really fun, cool things in here. Um, which actually, why does this? I guess I haven't updated this in a while. This um, uh, crap. Uh, here we are. This Twitter, this Twitter thread has like tons of stuff in here. Um, and see if I can find one. Here we are. 
Oh, Devine's thing is crazy. Yeah. yeah, like this thing is like off the charts. Um, but everyone builds, like there's some really cool implementations, but no one's really done the kind of infrastructure work to make it easy to make one of these things, um, at least not in any kind of accessible way. So um, I think, no, I guess Notion is kind of- I've a seen a lot of people have success with Notion. Yeah, people like Notion. I don't mind it. Um, I mean, Arena is another one, right? Um, actually, Arena, um, Arena was a big influence actually for me writing my own wiki, which was I saw all my friends using Arena and I didn't, I don't think the business model for Arena is very viable. So I'm not convinced they're going to be around in five years. Um, I don't say that like negatively. I don't want them to not be around. I want them to survive, but I'm just not necessarily convinced they're going to make it. Um, so I get very nervous about like trapping my wiki inside this thing, um, even though it has like the social element and it has, you know, following and commenting and stuff. So it has some things that my wiki doesn't do. Um, the kind of point of my wiki for me is like, I, I kind of want to grow this knowledge base over a long period of time. And I want to remember these cool things. Like just the other day, uh, like yesterday I think it was, like I was trying to remember this cool thing that I'd seen um, that was an, an atlas, a critical internet atlas. And I swear to God, like it took me like a long time to find this, like it was in my brain, but I was Googling like map of the internet by French artist didn't come up. And I was like, oh, crap, like, how do I find this thing that is like, I, I don't know, like, I, I forgot the Atlas term, but I remember the term map, but I couldn't find it. And this is the kind of thing that I want to remember in 20 years. Like, this is like, just such a transformative, like foundational thing for me of like, form and function and thinking and idea and art and web stuff. Like, I just, if you haven't seen this, I just like, I, I go nuts for this thing. I just absolutely love it. Um, and I want to, I want to keep it. I want to save it. I want to remember it. Um, and so for me, the wiki is a home for these things that I want to like stick around. Um, so yeah. Yeah. I think also the like security of plain text influences me a lot in like why I wouldn't use notion or arena for building a personal wiki, right? Where there's something really comfortable about it. it's all going to be there. It's all going to be transportable. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I think it would be work if I, if like, if, if, if GitHub pages, if Jekyll went away and I decided that I want to move my Jekyll site to some other kind of CMS, it would be work, but I don't think it, I think it would be possible. Like it would be a custom script basically to say, how do I yeah. turn these like markdown files into some other format? Maybe I've turned into HTML first and then turn them into like, it's got to be doable, right? It's just text, yeah. right? So, so, you know. Hmm. Any other questions? Uh, Rolf is curious about Glitch. Yeah, uh, I love Glitch. Oh my God, I can talk about it's Glitch. super cool. Um, uh, so Glitch is, so if you're familiar with something like CodePen, um, one of those places that lets you basically like write and host a little code snippet online. Um, Glitch lets you do that, um, but they also let you do server-side stuff. So they'll let you run a little mini server um, and, and make like a little web app, basically. Um, I have built lots of things on top of Glitch. Um, I will show you how easy it is to make stuff on Glitch. Uh, for an anecdote for how easy it is, I've been using Glitch with a bunch of middle schoolers to build their first websites, and they all like totally get it. It's super slick. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, it's great for education. So this is, um, I wanted to prototype this like digital learning tool thing. Oh, um, So I'll show you the, the front end looks like this, which is like, this is it. Like this is the front end running version of the app where I'd like prototype this idea of like iframing content in and having like lessons next to it. And then you'd have like these like, you know, okay, like the, what am I learning? Um, like these like moments for reflection and like these different lessons with different iframes, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I didn't like, you know, uh, but the back end is just this, which is their like web IDE. Um, and it's just literally like you just write the HTML, you write the JavaScript, you write the CSS, and then it's like automatically saved. It's like Google Docs, it's like auto saves, there's no saving, there's no server. I don't hit run anywhere. I just go back and refresh this. And I'm like, oh, cool. Um, like it's just super easy and there's no setup, it's free. Um, it's really, it's really, I really recommend it for like, like, for uh, making prototypes, for exploring, for having fun. Um, it's really, it's really cool. And as CJ demonstrated, like you can embed them in places and that can enable really cool features and connections. Yeah, yeah, so that, so this is an example I was, uh, 
I was at that annotations conference um, earlier this year. Um, and uh, I was trying to persuade them that their like you mobile UX for hypothesis was broken. Hmm. And I said, what if it worked like this? Um, and, sorry, these things take a while to wake up if no one's on them sometimes. Um, so I basically said, I built like a little like, um, uh, why is it not working? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was like, what if they show up like this on the bottom on mobile? This makes a lot more sense. Like this, U, this UI is just better oh, yeah. than this like side draw. Um, yeah, it's not perfect, whatever. It's like, you can see it's like a little janky, but it was like a, a total proof of concept that I made in about 20 minutes. Um, and they were like, oh, that is cool. That does actually like work quite well. <laughs> uh, and so that was like, that, that's for me, that's the power of Glitch is like having this little thing you can share, you can collaborate on them, right? You can have like real time editing in Glitch, uh, just like Google Docs. Um, you know, it runs little server side things, little applets. It's great. I, I, I can't recommend. Just try it out. Play around. It's really fun. Yeah. Um, any other Sweet. questions? I have what is probably a very mundane question. But yeah. uh, in committing to Git, do you have, this is because I, uh, I just set up like an analytics page that combs over my entire Git history and for the site. And so I was wondering. Do you have like a, do you commit every day, every time you do a blog post, like how do, is there a cadence for when things get pushed up to GitHub? Uh, so every time I blog, I have to, um, I have to push to Git. Yeah. Uh, every post that goes, every change I want to make on my website is a, is a push to Git. Um, how do you see all of the pushes? Uh, uh, commits over there. I don't even know. Right under that. manage topics. Uh, I thought this was Windows in the way. We, we can't see any of those, so it's just you dragging things oh, around. Yeah, yeah. yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, you can see that I'm very verbose with uh, the, uh, my Git commits. Yeah. I always use the F key. <laughs> um, uh, so basically, I don't take advantage of anything that GitHub has to offer, really, cool. except for this kind of like uh, robustness of being able to store it in the cloud and the fact that GitHub runs Jekyll and hosts GitHub pages for me. Um, uh, I don't think anyone has ever like issued a pull, I wouldn't even know what to do if somebody issued, issued a pull request. Um, I'm not a Git, I'm not a Git user. Um, 18 but, stars though. Uh, where do I, I don't even know what that is. That, oh, that, yeah. Yeah, oh, people have started, apparently. Who are these people? I don't even know. <laughs> Great, yeah, cool, I don't know. Nice, I guess people are using it, that's nice. <laughs> uh, Saga asks, what's the text, uh, this is Visual Studio Code. Um, that has the uh, the lovely and annoying feature of not having a spell checker in it. Oh. Um, I think I can install one, but I haven't figured out how to do it. In fact, I, I had installed one, and then I got a new computer, and I haven't I haven't mm. installed spell checker on this yet. But yeah, I should do that. I should really do that because <laughs> some of my projects, some of my posts uh, have typos in. Sweet. Um, we're right about an hour from where we started, so I think it yeah. seems a natural point to close off. Uh, any final questions, thoughts, anyone? Sagar, uh, Sagar is amused that you write in VS Code. <laughs> oh, so, so, so I will say, uh, let me sh um, So this is a good hack for anyone that wants to write things that are a little bit longer. Um, let's see. So this is, a, this is a common workflow that I use my longer posts, which is, uh, I'll draft it anywhere. Could be Code Studio, could be Google Docs, whatever. Um, and then uh, I'll write it as a Google Doc and I'll send it to people for commenting. Um, oh, why does no one look like a comment? So let's see. Mm. Oh, yeah. Comments and text. So basically, like when you ask people to review a draft and add comments, they read it very closely. Um, and so I'll, a lot of my like chapter length blog posts, I'll, I'll write and then ask for. Um, ask for comments on from like five or 10 people that I know. Um, and I end up with this kind of like, yeah, they're loading in, like all of these comments all through the thing. These like people closely reading the blog post. Um, and what this does is A, it makes the post way better than if I hadn't had all of these comments in here. Um, but B, it means that all of these people are, are them personally reading it really closely, which is valuable to me because they're influential, interesting people. Um, but C, when I put it live, I can just ping all these people that commented on it and said, hey, that thing that you helped me, uh, 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 this thing that you helped me um, edit and write is now live. Um, and they often usually help promote it and share it. Um, so this is like a really great, like little kind of small B blogging engine, which makes sure that 
even if not a lot of people read a post, some of the right people are definitely going to read it and they're definitely going to read it closely. Um, and then obviously you know, in the back end, there's a process for like copy and pasting this into, into code studio and putting it on my site, but um, just kind of philosophically, I really like this idea of like drafting, a, you know, putting a draft, getting edits on the draft from interesting people uh, and then like involving them and like helping to, to promote it when it goes live is a nice little feedback loop that um, works really well for me. Wait, so once they, once they comment, how do you like, how do you alert them? Do you, uh, I, 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 I mean, however, I know them. Like some of these people I know on Twitter, some of them I know on email. <laughs> oh, okay, got it. Yeah. You know, one of them is my brother. <laughs> um, uh, I'll like get yeah, one by one. I'll just go out and I'll, eat, I'll I'll ping them one by one and say, hey, that thing that you helped me with is now live. Um, uh, thanks for editing. Thanks for commenting. Whatever. Uh, so. Got it. Thank you. This was uh, this was really good. Really helpful. Um, as I as I <laughs> as I begin to get started and pull my stuff together. Awesome. I so guess yes. we should wrap it up. Yeah, thank you so much for walking us through it, Tom. Yeah, thank um, you for, for hosting. Thanks for having me. Yeah, for anyone, just a couple context things. This, and as well as the blockchain thing CJ is doing, is part of uh, this like website slash experiment thing I'm doing called hyperlink.academy for collecting like learning experiments on the internet. So if you're interested, check that out. And check out CJ's blockchain experiment uh, and get on that. But thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you again, Tom. Thanks for having cool. me, and uh, I'll see you on Twitter, guys. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Jared. Thanks. Yeah.